The Primarch of the Death Guard known as Mortarion is an absolute monster. He's the Lord of Death and the Plague God's chosen champion. A Reaper sent to bring death to the Imperium of Man as armies march across the galaxy, drowning out any resistance they come across in a sea of pestilence and disease. His ultimate goal, to let the galaxy rot. But he didn't always used to be this way. In fact, Mortarion was once known as a great liberator and a slayer of tyrants. Now his methods were admittedly always brutal, but he used those methods to rid the galaxy of those who would oppress others. The man he once was has become a twisted and unrecognizable parody. The slayer of tyrants and the bane of witches has become a psychic tyrant in his own right. Now, if you're a 40K veteran, you're probably aware of his origins, how his homeworld of Barbarous was ruled over by necromantic alien overlords that saw humanity as playthings to be hunted and experimented on. And you're probably also well aware of that fateful flight towards Terra, where Morty and his Death Guard were turned into the rotting legion we know today. But where did it all start? What was Mortarion's mission before he became corrupted? Well, today we're gonna deep dive a novel known as The Pale King by David Annandale, as it gives us an excellent account of his very first crusade after having been reunited with his legion. A crusade that even before the onset of the Horus Heresy, the Imperium tried to cover up the details of. So let's take a closer look at the Death Guard's very first crusade, the liberation of Galaspar. But before we get into all of that, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, and then we're gonna dive headfirst into the grimdark. Stay tuned. I wanna tell you about the sponsor of this video, Established Titles. Established Titles is a company that gives you the unique opportunity to become a lord or a lady. They're based off of an old Scottish tradition where landowners were referred to as lords, ladies, or lairds. So the way it works is Established Titles will sell you at least one square foot of land in Edelston, Scotland. And by owning that plot of land, you're technically a lord or a lady. It's pretty simple, and the purchase goes to a really good cause, as Established Titles will plant one tree for every plot they sell. It's a really great way of helping out the environment because established titles also works really closely with charities such as One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future in order to preserve forests around the world. And since you're now officially a lord or a lady, you can add that title to pretty much anything. From plane tickets to credit cards. You can even put it on your dating profile if you want. They give you a really cool certificate like this one that details your exact plot number. And if you ever found yourself in Scotland and wanted to visit your land, you technically could. Established Titles has told me that the first 200 people that use my link will have their plot set up right next to mine so we can build our own little West Hammer Kingdom together. It makes a super unique last minute gift for the holidays. And you can be happy with your purchase decision, knowing that a portion of the proceeds are going to a good cause. Established Titles is also running a huge Black Friday sale right now. And if you use the code WEST10, you'll get an additional 10% off your entire order. So don't wait around. Check out the link in the description of this video and become a Lord or a Lady today. Thanks again to Established Titles for sponsoring this video. And with that out of the way, let's get back into the grimdark. The book begins with Mortarion meeting with his brothers Horus and Sanguinius in the aftermath of the destruction of Galaspar. This was a world that was set to be brought into compliance. However, their defenses were great and they were resistant. Mortarion had taken it upon himself to invade this world prematurely. As the first crusade of the newly formed Death Guard after the Dusk Raiders had been reunited with their lost Primarch. Horus and Sanguinius have come to witness the totality of his destruction firsthand from the smoldering wreckage of its cities to the countless piles of corpses their brother has left in his wake. They claim to seek only to understand what had happened and why Mortarion had done what he did. During the Great Crusade, the goal was to reunite all of the human worlds under one banner. However, it had been thousands of years since they had been united, and having had to fend for themselves for so long meant many of them were not willing to join the Imperium peacefully, and a war would have to be waged. But in such an undesirable situation, there were rules for the Astartes to follow. Wars were to be conducted with honor, and the end goal was to have the planet and its population willingly want to contribute to the Imperium and be loyal. What Mortarion's brothers witnessed here was nothing short of a massacre. The Lord of Death was under no false pretenses that he was in fact on trial, even though his brothers insisted that they just wanted to understand. So Mortarion tells them of the death of Galaspar. There's a really interesting moment here that gives us some insight into who Mortarion is as a man. When Horus and Sanguinius greet him, they say they are genuinely glad to see him. Horus holds out his arms to embrace his brother, and since admittedly Mortarion is glad to see him, he gives in and hugs him, but breaks from it quickly. Not because of any animosity towards Horus, but because he genuinely disliked the gesture. 
Mortarion is not much of a hugger. To him, an embrace was a promise of unity and comfort, which from his perspective, made it a lie. The narrator makes a point of telling us that he puts a lot more stock into the ceremonial drinking of poison that him and his death guard participate in. To share a draft of concentrated toxins with your brothers is to embrace the truth of the universe and war, that there were no illusions when drinking poison. It was an acknowledgement of risk and the inevitability of death. And considering that Mortarion and half of the Death Guard had hailed from Barbarous, a world coated perpetually in toxic fumes and ruled over by necromantic overlords that viewed the population as nothing but livestock, we can kind of understand how he adopted such a worldview. Mortarion asks his brothers what is it that they think he has done, and they tell him that they don't think anything, they're just here to observe and hear his side of the events, that they've simply come to understand. He tells him there is nothing to understand, there is no great mystery. He came here to bring Galaspar into compliance, and he had succeeded. Sanguinius tells him that the way he had gone about this was unprecedented, that it was unlike any other campaign the Space Marines had ever waged, and thus, there may be something to be learned from Mortarion's methods. They tell him the scribes and the remembrancers wish to document the accounts from some of the members of the Order, and ask where Mortarion has kept his prisoners. He tells him that there are none, that every member of the Order was now dead, and he gestures out towards the corpse piles in the distance. Sanguinius and Horus seem shocked by this, and he tells him that there is no need for them to have lived, as they kept extensive records. Anything the two Primarchs would possibly want to know could be found in the Order's archives. He tells them, you want to understand why I conducted this war and how. Very well, I'll tell you. Galaspar was a wasteland of a world. There were no oceans or greeneries, as they had all been destroyed long ago. The entire world was coated in virulent clouds of toxins, by all accounts making it completely uninhabitable. Yet even still, the planet was home to 30 billion souls. The world was dotted with dozens of enormous hive cities, their towers containing no windows, and it had been centuries since any other than Galaspar's elite had looked out on its toxic landscape. Despite all of this, there was wealth and grandeur here, but it was experienced only by Galaspar's elite, the members of the Order. These people lived in extravagant luxury, while the vast majority of the population was kept as slaves, forced to live on top of each other in filth and squalor deep within its underhives. It was a population that over the centuries had been completely broken. The Order doesn't even refer to them as people. They are simply known as labor units. Their lives measured only in their ability to produce. With every dull action above, suffering happened below. Here, the full misery of the Order held sway. Beneath the millions, there were the billions. The labor units, the items whose movements, dispositions, assignments, and distributions were controlled by the transfer up and down of parchment and its modification by stylus. The billions existed in the lower, broader halves of the hive spires. I say existed. They could not be said to have lived. When they slept, they curled into tiny alcoves in the walls, larvae in a honeycomb, or piled on top of one another in overcrowded holding tanks that stank of sweat and grime and suffering. They were like ants said Horus. They were worse, Mortarion told him. Ants labor for a purpose. They are a collective. These people were not even maggots. They did not even have the freedom to feast on the carrion of the planet. They were lower than any insect. They were property. He goes into much greater detail on just how horrifically these people were treated, but I won't get into that here. You can just fill in the blanks with your imagination. As he tells his brothers of Galaspar's sins, Mortarion finds his silent anger boiling up beneath the surface. He tells them that this is why he had come here. This is what he had to stop, that this wretched world had called his scythe upon themselves. When the Galaspar system was first encountered by the Great Crusade, exploratory ships were sent to herald the good news that the Imperium had come to reunite all of humanity. These ships were immediately attacked by the Order and destroyed. Now, at first, these accounts didn't really register with Mortarion, as a world refusing to join the Imperium upon first contact was not exactly unheard of. But there was something that troubled him. Uh, perhaps it was a premonition of sorts. Whatever it was, it made him take a closer look at the planet. Its striking resemblance to his homeworld of Barbarous caught his attention immediately. And when he saw how its people were treated, the horrors the Order was perpetuating against its own citizens, and the horrific conditions they were kept in, Mortarion became obsessed with this world. The reports were missing a lot of key details, 
but he saw the slavery and the tyranny, and that was enough. Mortarion used a series of holograms to speak with other military commanders about Glassbar, and the human forces inform him that they are aware of the situation, but considering their society didn't seem to have the ability to utilize warp travel, it didn't require immediate action. That their best option was to create a blockade around it until military forces could be spared to take the planet. Mortarion was in disbelief and asks when that will be. The commander has no real answer for him. It could be months, years, or perhaps even decades. All while the Imperium was waiting, the people of Galaspar would continue to suffer. The commander tells Mortarion that the complexities of the Great Crusade often get in the way of their preferred actions, but such was the way of things. He asked Mortarion if he has anything to suggest. He told him that, yeah, in fact, he did have something to suggest, that they delay no further and strike immediately without mercy. The commander tells him that, of course, we would all like to see that, but Mortarion cut him off and tells him, good, the Death Guard will liberate Galaspar. The commander informs him that the nature of the 14th's First Crusade is still being discussed, and Mortarion didn't have the authority to decide what that crusade will be. Mortarion lies to him and tells him that the Emperor had decreed it, and thus he had been granted full authority. The commander informs him that the Glassbar system had seven suns and multiple worlds. How did he plan on taking the capital without a blockade? Mortarion tells him that it is as he said, a sudden and decisive strike, a reaping of the scythe, that his fleet would strike so decisively the Order would not have time to bring their defenses to bear. The commander protests, saying that such a strategy wouldn't work, and Mortarion corrects him. It was the only strategy that could work. Mortarion informs him that their defenses would be irrelevant before killing the feed and setting to his preparations. My Death Guard, when I first came to you, I called you my unbroken blades. I promised you that justice would come from your hands. I vowed that doom would stalk a thousand worlds. On this day, Doom comes to the first of them. Humanity suffers on Galaspar. The Order rules this empire, and the Order is as obscene as the subjugation of its people is complete. Justice demands annihilation. Banish all thoughts of mercy, because mercy is the plaything of the coward and the lie of the tyrant. Today, the blade descends on tyranny's neck. Nothing shall stay our hand. No enemy can stand before us. Death is the truth that awaits all. We march with death. We are one with death. Now, let doom and justice be one. From the Order's perspective, the attack came as a straight line of blinking stars in the night sky, moving towards the planet. An attack like this was unprecedented. The Order had never been attacked, and they weren't ready for it. None of the Order's vessels were in the position to engage them, so they very quickly started to scramble together to mount a defense. The orbital guns were brought online and fired against the line of approaching vessels. Batteries of cannons with barrels hundreds of meters long rose from the planet's toxic soil to fire on the intruders. It took less than an hour for the entire planet to be bristling with guns, all of them aimed towards the heavens. Galaspar open fired. The High Council of the Order's holographs bloomed with light, indicating impacts and nothing short of complete destruction. The Order prematurely celebrated the obliteration of the enemy and an instantaneous victory, but the lights in the sky kept moving forward. You see, the Order had no idea that they were wasting their torpedoes on a line of remote-controlled asteroids that Mortarion had engineered and placed in front of his fleet. They were barely maneuverable, uh, mostly just having been designed to push all ahead full, but that didn't matter. The Order kept shooting, not in salvos, but in a storm of unrelenting fire. They had foolishly believed so heavily in the superiority of their own guns that the seemingly limitless explosions they were generating were blinding their systems from what was coming. The entirety of the Death Guard's fleet was stationed directly behind the asteroids, using them as a shield to absorb the incoming fire. When the Order's ships finally came about and witnessed the massive fleet, they attempted to strike at the middle of their formation, their ships coming up from underneath them and firing torpedoes in every direction, desperately attempting to disrupt the Death Guard's formation. Mortarion ordered the ships to keep moving forward, to engage the enemy but let none slow their advance. Whenever one of the Death Guard ships was critically injured, they would continue moving forward rather than retreat, in an attempt to take down as many of the Order's ships as they could before being destroyed. The ships ended up sacrificing themselves by breaking from the fleet and becoming a much more enticing target to the enemy. 
Theoretically, the fleet could have slowed down in its advance in order for those ships to remain safe in the heart of the formation. But to slow down would give the order precious time for it to bring all of its defenses together. Time the Death Guard didn't have. So the sacrifice of the ships and the hundreds of thousands on board them had to be made to ensure victory. Mortarion had not come to Galaspar to lay a siege. He had come to stab the Order in the heart. As the Death Guard's fleet entered the planet's orbit, they detonated all of the remaining meteors at once, raining fire and death down upon the world below. Not only did all of this debris do an enormous amount of damage, but it also ended up crippling the Order's targeting systems, and their guns were now firing blindly into the sky. Now, Mortarion knew that the targeting systems would eventually be repaired, and while that possibility existed, his fleet could not fully descend. So he tells all the other ships to fall back out of the range of the guns and engage any of the Order ships that were left. The fourth horseman, Mortarion's flagship, then descends through the planet's atmosphere and rammed itself directly into the upper portion of the hive, doing an inconceivable amount of damage and spiking the battle's death toll by tens of thousands with a single blow. With this, the ground invasion began, the fourth horseman unleashing its deadly payload of Astartes directly into the city's spires. There's a scene immediately after this, where two of the labor units are witnessing the Death Guard marching through the halls, armor-clad giants, unlike anything they had ever seen before. At their head was the largest of the giants, a man who wore no helmet but a cowl and wielded a massive scythe. They watched as the Order's warriors descended upon them in the thousands, but seemed to be doing little more than offering themselves up for slaughter, as Mortarion's scythe reaped through the masses and bolter fire detonated within their ranks, sending gory chunks flying in every direction, hundreds of soldiers disappearing with every heartbeat, claimed by the crimson reaping. The Death Guard pressed forward, never halting in their advance, marching through a sea of rubble and dismembered bodies. Each wave of the Order's attackers disappearing in front of them as if they had no more substance than smoke. To the labor units, these were more than giants. These were gods. Gods who had come to deliver the end of all things. As the corpses mounted higher and higher, many of the Order's rank broke and tried to flee. The Death Guard let none survive. As the Astartes advanced through the city, they increasingly became more and more divided, each segment breaking off into different halls over and over again, until they had all completely separated into smaller kill teams, all making their way towards the city and thus the entire Galaspar Empire's heart, the control center of the Order. Over the city's loudspeakers, the panic commands of the Order could be heard screeching, kill the invaders, all of Galaspar must fight. The masters were ordering a complete mobilization of the entire city, ordering the labor units to rise up against the invaders. The Death Guard continued their march and through their own Vox system shouted out to the civilians that they had come to free them, that they had come only for their masters and no harm would come to them. Many of the labor units were in the midst of a drug-induced frenzy due to the narcotics that the Order would routinely pump into them to maintain their compliance and increase productivity. Perhaps more importantly, many of them were more afraid of their masters than the Space Marines. The feeble, terrified masses clutched tightly in their hands makeshift weapons and were driven into battle by whip-wielding enforcers. The tragedy being that they were so unbelievably broken that they didn't understand they had a choice. The Death Guard couldn't afford to slow their advance for even a moment, so any that raised their arms against them were immediately cut down. The Astartes brought flamers to bear, halting the incoming waves in their tracks, giving them enough room to open fire with their bolters. It didn't matter that these people had been forced to attack by cruel and uncaring overlords. They took up arms against the Death Guard, and so they died. This wasn't true for all of the Death Guard kill teams. Uh, many more civilians heeded the Death Guard's warnings and retreated into the safety of their alcoves, while the giants brought death to their masters. Tercius and Gara were present on Galaspar and were rightfully sickened by what they were being forced to do. But more importantly, they reminded themselves over and over that the Order's madness, this utter disregard for human life, and the fact that the Order would force civilians into combat was exactly what Mortarion had come to end. That the end would be worth this massacre. It had to be. These thoughts brought no comfort to Tercius and Garo, but it kept them moving forward. At one point, the two Marines opened a hablock door and found hundreds of men, women, and children cowering in fear. While the Vox speakers continued to blare the orders to fight, 
they held out feeble, grime-caked hands to them, begging for a mercy that they had never before received in their life. Tercius took a moment, taken aback by just how miserable they were. He had never seen living beings that appeared so wretched. Tercius tells him to ignore the loudspeakers. If they do not fight, they will not be harmed. They had nothing to fear from the Death Guard. He sees in their eyes that this is the first time they have ever been given a promise instead of an order. He told them they would hear screams coming from the other side of the door and not to open it for any reason until the screaming stopped. He closed the door and sealed them away from the monstrosity that was coming. After the door was latched shut, he told his men to unleash their Phosphex grenades. Phosphex is one of the most feared and hated weapons the Imperium has ever utilized. Considered even in the grim darkness of the Great Crusade to classify as a war crime, a weapon whose creator was so horrified by what he had made that he tried to destroy all of its blueprints, a mission he ultimately failed in and was executed for heresy, killed by the weapon he had designed and subsequently tried to save the galaxy from. Liquid green fire tore through the Order's forces, liquefying them, inflicting on its victims a transcendent agony that caused their flesh to run like candle wax. Green flame rushed down the corridors, seeming to accelerate with malicious hunger as the Order tried to flee. Everything it touched suffered a torturous, hissing end. The closer the Death Guard got to the Command Spire, the more soldiers they ended up encountering. The final defense having so many of these soldiers packed tightly together that Mortaran remarked that they looked like worms writhing in their masses. Now, the tactic was obvious. The Order was seeking to slow the Death Guard's advance by drowning them in bodies. It made no difference to Mortarion, who cut through them with no remorse. By the time they reached the command area, the elites of the Order had retreated to the safety of an internal bunker, a bunker that then lifted up an elevator shaft before collapsing the way to them under 30 meters of rockcrete. Mortarion and his Death Shroud were the first to reach the entrance of the command center, but found that they were too late, that the enemy had moved and left one more line of defense a squad of human abominations that the Order referred to as the Wretched. Twisted amalgamations of people with potent psychic abilities that had been chained in the dark until the Order could finally use them as a last resort. And many of the Wretched's heads had become so enlarged that their necks couldn't support them, instead dragging them across the floor as they clawed their way towards Mortarion and his Death Shroud. Enraged by the sight of witchcraft being utilized in war, Mortarion obliterated them, permanently ending their suffering. After the Wretched had been killed, Mortarion looked at the Augur readings of the Spire and finds a concentrated heat cluster in one of its highest peaks. He realizes that this is where they must have retreated to, but unfortunately there is no obvious path to get to them. And to make things worse, reinforcements from the other Hive cities were closing in. Mortarion knew what must be done, and that sadly, much like on Barbarus, this would be another Spire he would not be able to reach the top of. He ordered a kill team to scale the outside wall of the Spire to try to break into the command center through its roof, while him and the rest of the Death Guard descended down to meet the reinforcements outside. Now, although Mortarion realized the irony of this situation, the Spires of Barbarus and Glassbar being remarkably similar, he thought to himself that this time would be different. There would be no intervention from the Emperor. Victory or defeat, whatever the outcome, it would be his and his alone. The Death Guard that were on Galaspar were around 10,000 strong at this point, but the enemy was in their millions. They deployed in what they call the Scythe Blade Formation, a single line of Marines with enough space between each warrior that an enemy explosion would only take out a couple of them. The formation served the secondary purpose of creating the illusion of a weaker force, ensuring that the enemy would foolishly overextend. The Death Guard advanced on the approaching reinforcements, deploying Rad and Phosphex weapons that scorched and blackened the enemy front lines, the roiling green flames engulfing enemy soldiers and tanks alike. The reinforcement army was forced to slow their advance as the Death Guard counteroffensive marched on them. The Phosphex weaponry caused the skin of the enemy soldiers to slough from their bodies, and any who would try to tear off their Enviro suits to escape its wrath would breathe in the toxic air of Glassbar causing their lungs to disintegrate. The Bleed of Death picked up its pace and cut deep into the enemy defenses, while Mortarion hurled himself forward, reaping tanks and enemy soldiers alike, vehicles splitting in half before him and severed heads falling like rain. 
the scythe formation transformed into a circle that surrounded the enemy soldiers, and every other legionnaire broke off to plunge forward into the enemy ranks, sowing confusion. The order ended up turning their own cannons on the reinforcements, trying to take out as many of the Death Guard as they could. And this very well could have been the end. But suddenly, the deafening boom of the Order's cannons fell silent. The cannons that had been leveled at Mortarion's ground forces, and the ones that had been firing nonstop blindly into the heavens to keep the fleets at bay. The kill team had been successful. They had broken into the Order's stronghold, capturing them, and thus muzzling all of their defenses. The fleet was now free to engage the planet, and the death of the Order was at hand. Judgment in its purest form rained down as munitions 30 meters long fell from the sky, striking with seismic power. Multiple mile-tall mushroom clouds erupted across the planet's surface, followed by drop pods in their thousands. The Order had fallen. The Death Guard were victorious, even if the surviving members of the Order, stationed in other cities, hadn't realized it yet. Now, despite this, the Death Guard's work was far from complete, and Mortarion swore he would not leave this world until every Overlord had been slain. The Order, in their desperation, attempted to reach Mortarion via Vox. They knew the end was here, but perhaps their lives could be spared, as even though their world was going to become part of the Imperium, their knowledge and expertise would still be useful to this new Order. Mortarion answered the call from the leaders of the next most powerful city, the acting High Controller on the other end told him that all the remaining members of the Order throughout the planet's hives were listening in on the channel and could hear his words. She then asked him what his terms were. And Mortarion told her very simply that he didn't have any. She told him that she didn't understand. And Mortarion says, I spoke clearly. I will repeat myself though. Uh, there are no terms. She said that, but they wish to surrender. And Mortarion told her, you can't. She said, but we no longer wish to fight you. And Mortarion tells her, that was never your choice. I came to destroy you. What you do in response to that is up to you. It's no concern of mine. The Death Guard reinforcements made their way through every other hive, eliminating any member of the order that they found, leaving the labor units untouched. The Order's pleas for mercy being met with the flashes of bolters. The Astartes, who had broken into the command center, drug the High Council out into a massive chamber. They were bound and forced to their knees in front of a massive horde of labor units. Mortarion strode forth and gave this speech to them. You are free. The Order is no more. It can never return. These wretches before you are the last of your rulers in this hive. Now see their end. His death shroud rose their sides and beheaded the former masters. In all the other hives of Galaspar, the Pale King continued, this is the fate of the Order. Not one of your former masters will be left alive. He paused. Our task here is done, but your task is beginning. Others will come, he announced. They will bring you fully into compliance with the Imperium of Man. I give you a final command. Tally the dead of the Order. They numbered you, now you number them. Find all their dead, count them all. Know the measure of your enslavement. Know the measure of your freedom. And so they did. The newly freed labor units dragged the corpses of the Order out into the wastes, stacking them in massive carrion hills, setting to work on tallying the dead. Back in the present, Sanguinius says that that will be enough. We have heard all we came here for. But Horus had one final question. He tells Mortarion that he questions the complete purge of the Order. Was there no value in leaving any of them alive? Martarion tells him that there was not. Every member of the Order left alive would be a piece of its structure left preserved, and even the smallest fragment would be more poisonous than the air of this planet. Sanguinius and Horus share a pained look and say that they both now fully understand and are ready to render their judgment. Horus asks Mortarion if he understands what he has done here, and Mortarion tells him that he does that this was the result he foresaw. Horse points out that just because he predicted this outcome does not mean that he understands. That he was correct in thinking a drawn out siege would have been vastly more costly, but that he did not understand the cost to the population of Galaspar. Mortarion stared back at him in disbelief, saying, they are liberated. Physically, they are, said Horace, and others, they are traumatized. They have seen death in the flesh reap through their world they do not know what freedom is. How could they? 
where would they have encountered it? The force that oppressed them was destroyed by a greater one. All they know is destruction. And then there is this tally, he says, gesturing to the mountains of corpses. They are doing it because it was a command. They see only meeting in obedience, not in the tally itself. I do not know what will happen to them when the tally is done and there are no further commands. Do you see? Liberation is not just the destruction of the oppressor. We can't replace one tyranny with another. This is what our father wants you to see, Mortarion. He wants you to understand the need for nuance in the crusade. You cannot always be the scythe. Look down below, brother. Look at the hills of bodies. You can see them even from this height. He gestured to the hordes of labor units, swarming over the corpse mounds like maggots on carrion. Is that liberation? There's a moment where Mortarion considers Horus's words, but he quickly shakes off that moment of weakness and turns to face his brother once again. I see the people of Galaspar, he said. I see what I have done, and I would do it again. I have ended the tyranny that enchained them. The tally of the dead is the task of a people who must see and know that their former masters are truly dead. And the cost? Well, everything has a cost. What do you think would have happened if we had accepted the cost of a blockade and a siege? Would the liberty of these people be a sylvan paradise? Perhaps the likes of Rabute would believe in such a vision. But I am no such fool. Sanguinius said, You are if you imagine yourself unique in your experience of a lethal homeworld. As you are too, if you think the manner of your conquest has no impact beyond the end itself. You came to Galaspar as the Angel of Death, Mortarion, not as a liberator. That is the core of the matter. Does that displease you, Sanguinius? Mortarion asked. Perhaps it does not. Perhaps it is useful to use me to burnish your own self-image. You broadcast the execution of the Lord Comptroller to billions, said Sanguinius. You brought death to this world and began what you call its moment of liberation with death. And yet the Eighth Legion spreads terror by any means it can. It has broadcast its share of executions. I have not seen them on trial. Enough, Horace shouts. Enough. It is all far beyond enough. We have seen enough. We know enough. Mortarion, you have done enough. Horace lowered his head for a moment, then looked up, regretful yet determined. Our father seeks the compliance of all inhabited worlds with the goals and the dreams of the Imperium. There is compliance here, but not with that dream. Instead, there is a wasteland and a population consumed by their fear of the Imperium, of the embodiment of death. Hear me, Mortarion. The conquest of Galaspar will forever be marked as a tragedy of the Great Crusade. It will never be celebrated. It will be the work of generations for the Imperium to undo what you have done here. You are censured, Mortarion, and your first command will be commemorated by mourning. Mortarion can feel his anger seething silently beneath the surface. And as Horus and Sanguinius turn to take their leave, Sanguinius tells him that he knows he won't believe him, but that he takes no pleasure in this judgment, and that hopefully the next time they meet, Mortarion will come to see their decision was the right one. Please learn from this, Mortarion. Learn that there is another path for you. Mortarion stayed on the planet's surface for some time longer. He gazed out over the destroyed landscape, over the fires and the bodies. Yes, there was ruin here, but ruin was better than the order. There was a purity in ruin. Horus was wrong. The landscape of Galaspar was not a tragedy. It was a victory. It was the grandeur of ruin. Despite Mortarion's feelings immediately after his brother's judgment, over time he would end up trying to take his brother's advice. This would take the form of the siege of the sorcerer planet known as Absurdus. In the hour of its final judgment, Mortarion would end up staying his hand when the ruler of the planet begged for mercy. It was an experiment to see if victory through mercy was actually possible. Their compliance would come with the caveat that all sorcery was to be banned, something that the planet agreed to. But sometime later, Mortarion sensed that something wasn't right, and he returned to the world to observe them in secret, finding that it was still deeply corrupted with sorcery, its wicked arts still being practiced across the world. He realized that mercy was a mistake, one he would never make again, and he killed Absurdus with a salvo of cyclonic torpedoes. Mortarion looked out at the void where Absurdus had been, and he ruminated on the meeting he had had with his brothers one year ago. He had this to say, my brothers were wrong in their censure, and I was wrong to have let the weakness of their sentiment cloud my judgment. 
their sentiment, and their perverse censure. Absurdus was a needed correction. It showed the error of moderation. The blade must never be restrained. He spoke the next sentence like a vow. We shall always be the scythe. Perhaps we are drawn to the campaigns that require us. Maybe there were worlds where Vulcan's concerns were the correct ones, where Sanguinius's nobility was needed. Not the worlds that fall in my path. Doom shall stalk a thousand worlds. 